Uh, my name is Ken Lewis. I'm the managing partner. I started off as the project manager, became the managing director, and now I'm a managing partner at SOM. Gives you a sense of the duration of a project like this. We began our work on October 16th of 2001, less than a month after 9-11 on a project that was the World Trade Center. Uh, we began with Seven World Trade Center, which was, in essence, an audition for the team for the projects that were going to come forward. Um, but I stand before you as representative of a very large team, Urim's team at WSP Cantor Sayanuk, uh, about 250 professionals that worked on the project that put their heart and souls into it. I also am here today for David Childs, who unfortunately is not well and apologizes for his absence. I spoke to him on the way over. He said, just put it simple, Ken, just talk from your heart. When we began the project, we sort of step back as we always do as architects at look at initial diagrams and look at the site. And we sort of step back and look at the city itself. And we found that the site that we were working on, the World Trade Center site, was in what it was, the North River, and is now the Hudson River. And over time, the city, as it was leveled, was pushed into the river, and it was built out here in the 18th century into the 19th century, and ultimately into the 20th century. As the city grew, its character changed. Uh, the waterfront became a center for business. Um, it was always a center. This is the, uh, the site is at the end of the trail, the broad way from Albany, where the Native Americans came down to trade, and was a center of trade. In 1960, it fell into um, disrepair, and two brothers, uh, David Rockefeller of the Chase Manhattan Bank, actually man manufactures Hanover, and Nelson Rockefeller, the governor, decided that we needed an urban renewal project. There were two components to the renewal project. One was the building of the World Trade Center, and the other was the dredging of uh, New York Harbor to make way for international trade, and that the Trade Center would be the home for all of those companies, these international companies that would be in the Trade Center, uh, and there would be a new community, Battery Park City, that you see to the west, uh, in this case, to the left of the Trade Center. Well, when the Trade Center was done, many things happened. Um, it was built by a brilliant architect, or designed by a brilliant architect, Minoru Yamasaki. But he built it, and no character intended, but as a sort of samurai castle where all roads were blocked, and the site itself was elevated 32 feet. And it was appropriate because the area of Lower Manhattan was in downturn and it had to stand on its own. Well, 9-11 provided us uh, an unfortunate opportunity to look at the site as a moment to reconnect the city with all parts of the city back together again, to reestablish that Manhattan grid we know so well. And another grid, which most aren't familiar with, what we call the river grid of uh, Greenwich Street, the original edge of New York City, uh, Washington Street and West Street and connect them across, connecting Battery Park City to the left with the financial district, connecting Tribeca with the lower, Manhattan, lower Greenwich Street. So this is a sketch that David did very initially as we were working on seven and beginning to think about it. And it was just two simple moves and a memory element. The two moves are the continuation of Greenwich Street through the site on the north-south direction and the connection of Fulton Street to the east and west. And the memory element of the two footprints uh, of the Trade Center, the two north and south tower, and then the tower, which was dictated by the master plan by Daniel Liebeskin. And today, it fits, follows almost exactly that master plan that was determined. Uh, and as these buildings come up, um, we'll see the completion of the spiraling design. The other part of this, and is a a large part of what I'll talk about today are the memory elements of the building. And as the uh, Michael Arad and Peter Walker design memorial are the void in our city, and it's really quite beautiful when Michael speaks about it, the fountains going down to the loss, the tower marks in the skyline the loss uh, uh, of our skyline. And the 1776, the date of our uh, independence, also is part of the master plan. But within the form we've acknowledged the buildings, the height of 1,368 feet and 1,362 feet, the buildings weren't the same height, in the singular tower that remains. And so the form of the building also has a memory element. The two towers were 200 by 200 by 1,368 feet high, approximately. And depending on the angle that you see the towers, it either has the figure of the old building or it has this sloped changing form as it rotate and as you rotate around the building. Here you see that figure 
as stood as a memory element. So how does this geometry take place? The simple geometry of the 204 feet at the base is a square, and the 150 feet at the top is a rotated square. And all the engineers here are doing the uh, math, you know, the square root. Um, the, it's actually 140 feet, if you did your math. And as you see, these four isosceles triangles are connected from the top to the bottom. And at various points, it becomes an octagon, and its shape changes as it goes up. Um, I think Douglas would say and make a point of the fact that every single floor plate is different in the building, and that was a challenge in and of itself, but also, again, a reaction to the Old World Trade Center. The Old World Trade Center had large floor plates with a minimum core of a high-rise building, and we were determined to maintain this flexibility that we built into the building, and how do we do that? We looked at the many different typologies. You see a law firm at the bottom, a consulting firm in the middle and a financial firm at the top, a hedge fund type operation. Well, they all have different requirements. But as we were talking about those requirements, column free space, uh, high efficiency systems, sustainability, we also talked about this person that you see here. We have two versions, a man and a woman, and it's a young person making his decision about his life and where they're going to work and where they're going to put in 2,500 hours of work or 3,000 hours of work a year and the quality and character of that space the internal space became the driver. And so we looked at ways of maximizing daylight. We looked at all of our work across the, across the, the world and what was, what was driving how people worked. And we realized we needed flexibility. Another memory element for the building are the corners of the tower, these pinstripes that run down that are in an embossed stainless steel. The material is uh, reminiscent of the corners of the Trade Center. I'm from Philadelphia, I drive back and we were thinking about what is this light that we see at the end of the day. And it's because of the Manhattan grid, which is orthogonal, that the corners, which were on 45 degrees, would pick up this special light at the beginning and end of the day. And that's the light that we see in the uh, triangle and the edge of the building. We also were working to create a monolithic form, a form that would be iconic, that a child, when he's going back to the Midwest or to Europe after his trip to New York, would sketch out a sort of pure form, a simple form, one that lets the resonance of the place come through. And that form was, had to be reinforced through all, through the material of the building, through its luminosity, its way it treated light. And we went with a full, the largest insulated glass unit. Um, it was so large that there was no production plants, that uh, we challenged the contractors to come forward. And what you see here is the two pieces. It's a singular, uh, the largest piece of insulated glass. The last piece, and I'm going to turn it over to, um, for this portion, is the podium. And the podium that the tower rests on is the place that aspirates for the building, the large mechanical areas, the lobby space itself. There's half a million square feet that's below grade, and it all breathes through this building, including the train tracks that run underneath the building, another challenge uh, to the project. And behind that is a massive uh, belt truss and I'm going to turn it over to Urim to talk a little bit about the structure. Thank you, Ken. It's really a shame that we uh, made it all the way from New York just to tell you that we may not be able to tell you everything about the structure. However, if you promise to vote for us... <laughs> okay. Um, this is the belt truss, as Ken described at the base of the building. It's part of our redundancy system for the entire structure. And you can see... You can see that it's uh, basically this truss is picking up the tower columns that's running all the way up the tower and basically allowing two things. One is the redundancy I described before and also this large opening that is basically open and allows some light to get into the uh, uh, lobby. The structural system um, is not a new system for us. Um, it's the hybrid lateral force resistance system, and it's comprised of a concrete core uh, that is um, basically constructed of a few compartments uh, that part of them drop as you go up the tower. The core is reducing in size, obviously. Uh, it's surrounded by a perimeter steel moment frame uh, to allow, to allow um, a lot of light to get inside for the users. 
Um, that moment frame is designed also for redundancy. And um, the floor framing is also um, made out of steel. Uh, this is a good example of uh, floor plates. Um, it basically shows you the core is divided into two sections, the north core and the south core, and they're linked through four link beams in the center. These beams are made of structural steel that is, you can see on the right in the photo during construction, that is embedded into the concrete wall, basically developing the steel section. Uh, it was decided to do that uh, due to the very high demand on the link beams, and also uh, it was coordinated with a mechanical distribution and allowed for higher ceilings. At the top of the tower, we have a series of outrigger members. Uh, they are coordinated with the mechanical systems that are surrounding them um, over um, four stories. And they basically help to control the drift on the tower. Uh, this is the belt truss that um, we showed before. Uh, it basically shows you the load path um, that allowed for this large opening um, at the entrance. What you can also see that the tower is surrounded by concrete walls, um, almost all around, for security obviously, but with that there is a lot of natural light that gets into the lobbies. Um, this is only a good example of how Revit actually developed. So Autodesk was in the process of developing Revit structures. The architectural module was relatively developed, not as today, obviously, but it was the first one to come out. The structural model was developing at that time, and um, it was back then very, very slow and very complex to operate, uh, certainly not as easy as today. Um, so that every drafter in our, you know, uh, department wanted to work on the job. Why? Because you just click a button and you can take a coffee break because the processing was very, very slow. Then we said, okay, why don't we add more drafters? Maybe, you know, through, you know, a few intersections. If you try to attack the same problem, maybe it goes faster. No. The minute you add more, it becomes even slower. So. That was back then. Obviously, today, Revit is a fantastic design tool, essential. Um, just to tell you that Autodesk had two technicians in our office. Uh, basically, we helped them identify and improve the structural module of uh, Revit. Do you want to elaborate on this? I'm going to jump ahead because we're going to run out of time. We're very short. But the most important thing about Revit was this was the first tall building done in Revit. The size of the model when we concluded, which ultimately became unusable, was 120 gigs. Um, so our, the same size project today would probably be 30 gigs maybe maxed out. These pieces of steel are massive, um, large scale. This uh, challenged the construction industry. I think there were 10 shops that were putting the yes. steel together. So this is another um, a few photos of the belt truss. Um, what we had, the belt truss had two significant hubs to collect loads. One is what we call the flat nodes on the flat face of the building. And the other one was the corner node that comes in here. Uh, and this is what the corner node is doing. It's basically collecting loads from the tower and through this hub, transferring them down through the belt truss to the base of the building. This is a good example uh, how um, good collaboration among the design team works very well. So the architect wanted to express the corner of the building and basically the cladding wraps around the structure. So what you can see here, this is the constraint. This was done in Revit. This is also in Revit. Um, in order, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time to study how to transfer these loads, but it's interesting. What we decided to do in order to um, see that it's constructible, this element, we decided to build it out of balsa wood here. We then decided to build it out of three elements. And eventually, that's the way it was erected, constructed and erected in the field. What you can see here, this is the shop. Um, these three elements are erected in the shop by bolted connection, then were taken apart and installed, erected in the field. They just did that to make sure they fit exactly and made any adjustments necessary in the shop. You can just see the scale of this element. This is over 90 feet long, combined. 
So how do we challenge ourselves with such a massive belt truss, uh, basically a blank wall at the base of the building? And we engendered a team where we challenged our team to work with light and glass, the materials that we had been working with throughout the building. The base is luminous. All of the lights are addressable. This is, uh, we anticipate uh, and tied that luminous base to the fountains of the memorial. Each light is addressable. We anticipate that an artist will be uh, doing a piece on the base of the building. So we created this element, which is really a fundamental. It fits into the curtain wall. It's uh, perforated metal with the glass fins. They're all in a fixed position, but they open. I'm just going to go back. They are open or closed depending on where the building needs to aspirate. And the aperture that we go through that you saw, the concrete wall, becomes a luminous piece with dichroic glass, the canopies, and light coming from inside and out. Working with Hans Schober at uh, Schleicher Bergman, uh, it was a cable net wall that provides incredible protection, not just from those uncontrollable elements, but the elements that we all sadly are aware of. The building has four simple entrances. One is for the observation deck. The other is for the regular employees and tenants and visitors to the building. There are no major devices. You don't walk through a magnetometer, but the building provides protection. It also provides another memory element, which is the 60-foot height of the ceiling and the white Carrera marble. The program for the building overall is uh, 3.5 million square feet, half a million square feet below grade. It's fundamentally an observation deck at the top, a sky lobby, and retail at the base. The retail has the most important part of the project in terms of its sustainability. It connects to an underground network, the concourse, and to the Calatrava uh, transportation hub, as we call it, and will shortly open. This is a network that connects all 11 uh, subway lines and the path line in Lower Manhattan to all of the buildings, which connects also to the memorial. The Sky Lobby, obviously, in a, a building like this, um, uh, architects anticipate beautiful women walking in the building. Little did we know that they're there. Um, if you don't know, it's Vanity Fair and Condé Nast's uh, Vogue magazine. Um, a lot of people are going over and trying to hang out in the building. The observation deck has been exceeded all expectations. Uh, so far, they anticipate about 3.5 million to 4 million people going to the building. Um, I recommend it for the views, obviously, but it also is an experience that's the next generation of observation decks. A very successful piece of real estate um, the area is approximately 72,000. The lease is for $825 million for 15 years. So I'm going to pause for a second and just go through some pictures. We could not forget about those events, those horrible days, <clears throat> and the loss of a colleague, Arkady Zaltzman, who went over, got a call, as every architect does, from a client to help him out with a problem. He didn't make it out. He called the office. He said he would see us soon. And to talk about the firemen and how they had to go up into that building as people were going out. People, as you can see here, are turned to the side. The rescue efforts were slowed down, frankly, by the fact that the way we fight fires today and our size and how we walk is different than when the code was written in 1968. And so we examined the stairs, we examined the systems, and we created a series of guidelines. All doors need to lead into path of travel. There needs to be an area, that's rectangle that you see there, of rescue assistance should a colleague need to take a break or someone's disabled and provide a chair for them to be carried down by their colleagues. Provide redundancy and lighting. Provide those two uh, wireless antennas so that people can communicate and the uh, responders can communicate. And to provide a large shaft to pressurize the stairs. Now these are standards that were uh, common in Europe and in the IBC and we began to move forward with this long before the code that was finally enacted in 2014 in New York City. The stairs themselves, we made go straight as best possible, go straight up and down the building to provide a redundancy of exits at the ground floor and to provide a new stair, a responder stair, the green stair that you see there in the lower left-hand corner of the core, that would provide an access point for the responders and a dedicated uh, fireman's lift in European terms, but is a full-time service elevator that switches uh, its service if there's an emergency. We also uh, looked at the large service elevators and made them into lifeboats that the firemen could use. The sustainability is a story unto itself. Uh, I won't go into it other than to say all of the energy in the building comes from uh, renewable resources in New York State that happens to be hydro. 
We have fuel cells. And at the peak of the building, Antony, is a beautiful spire that is 1,776 feet high. Um, it was an enjoyable day here. We, we really was to sort of, sort of question ourselves on these issues. Um, the lightning air terminal at the top you see there. And as we see in the city, the building has become an icon. My son calls me every time <clears throat> he gets off the train or the plane. He says, I, I can see it from where I'm at. Thank you very much. Thank you.